We all love networking, and I think I can tell you why. It's just one letter away from not working. <laughs> Come on in, please, and uh, let me just turn this over to Jay for a moment. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, your active participation and the not working networking. Uh, I just want to make uh, one special introduction. Uh, we're honored to have a special guest with us uh, during the middle of the morning here. And it's my pleasure to introduce and ask you to uh, share a warm welcome of applause, round of applause uh, to say hello to Ambassador Ken Quinn, President of the World Food Prize Foundation from Des Moines, Iowa. Ken. And just a reminder for those of you who have never been, uh, it'll be the week of October 14th in Des Moines uh, is the next series of World Food Program uh, Dialogues and the recognition of the next laureate. So welcome and congratulations Thank for all the great work that you're doing in extending the legacy of Dr. Norman Borlaug. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. So we're going to talk now. We're going to try and um, narrow the focus a little bit, which won't be uh, hard compared to the last conversation. Um, we're going to talk about... Uh, Obesity and hunger. I'm going to very briefly introduce the panelists. I may tell you a little bit more about them um, as we move along. On the far right, we have Tom Arnold. Tom is the former CEO, among other things, of Concern Worldwide, a leading anti-hunger group. To his left is Steve Sanka. Steve comes from the University of Illinois, where he directs the ADM Institute for the Prevention of Post-Harvest Loss, so we'll talk some about food waste as part of the solution. Uh, next to Steve is Jason Halford. Jason is the convener of the Obesity Research Network at the University of Liverpool, so he's going to talk about uh, the role of food in actually helping to solve the obesity problem. And to my immediate right is Shengen Fan. Shengen uh, is Director General of the International Food Policy Research Institute here in Washington, D.C. And uh, great to have both Shengen and Tom here. We're going to broaden the conversation to the uh, global, oh, as well as Jason. We've got three global folks here. So this is, we're going to get beyond the concerns of. Uh, the food elites here in the U.S., which took up some of the conversation earlier this morning. So, Steve, I actually want to start with you. I want to get back to, to, to something we uh, talked about a bit earlier. Um, Steve told me last night he grew up on an Iowa farm. Uh, he's an economist, so you understand food, you understand markets. Can I get your thoughts just as we begin this uh, on this question of aggregate supply. Um, you read so much these days about can we feed the world 9 billion, 10 billion people that we're looking at in 2040 or 2050. And yet, historically, as we saw this morning, or as we talked about this morning, um, despite problems of distribution, the food supply has grown briskly over the last 50 and 100 years through advances in technology, trade, and markets. What's your level of concern about long-term supply? Is that really the problem, or is the problem something else having to do with distribution, poverty, et cetera, when we talk about hunger? The, thinking about the word concern, um, do I think we will be able to uh, adequately feed 9 billion people in uh, 25, 30 years, something like that? Yes. That, but saying yes uh, doesn't mean that I have no concern. Uh, as one of my friends in agronomy uh, pointed out to me, uh, tr yen, trend yield increase isn't given by, isn't preordained. We, we, we talk in agriculture, agricultural economics, about trend yield increases, and they move forward. There's nothing that says that has to keep going. I mean, it's, it, it, I think it will keep going because of effort of people and institutions, organizations. But it isn't just preordained that it has to continue. Uh, and, I, and I think there are, there are a lot of technology options, uh, hopefully continued market uh, openings that, that, that go back to my first comment about uh, I, I feel fairly good about the $9 billion. The how, the, the impact, 
uh, the distribution are all important questions, but in, in, in short, um, for what it's worth, uh, I do think, we, I'm actually fairly confident given um, that it, it was 40 years ago when I was a graduate student and we were reading books like The Population Bomb and Limits to Growth, and the issue there, the phrase is very much like, I think the Ehrlich wrote, that uh, the world's food supply situation is, is known. The optimistic scenario is that we'll have mass starvation in two decades. The pessimistic scenario is we'll have uh, mass starvation and the, the Earth's death rate will go up. It was 13, it's now 8 per thousand. Uh, and so, you know, we have somehow managed to move beyond that, and I think we will, but it's not preordained that we will. And one follow-up question on that. Isn't there tremendous opportunity simply by spreading the knowledge and practices of the world's most productive farmers to the world's less and least productive farmers? In other words, absent new technology isn't simply lifting the level of those who are not performing in optimal ways higher a huge untapped opportunity. It, it certainly is, but I wouldn't phrase it exactly like that. I'm probably most excited about anything in technology space being the cell phone because we can now have what was talked about yesterday at another conference as about real knowledge exchange. And, and, and that's the way the land-grant system, the extension system in the U.S. worked it wasn't about the universities telling farmers what to do. They provided knowledge, but the farmers, through the extension agent, told the researchers what was important to work on. We, we now have, with this wonderful thing called the cell phone that we're all anchored to, uh, around the world, we have the capability to actually have that knowledge exchange. And I think that's how. So it's not about the developed country farmers telling developing countries farmers what to do. It's about raising their capability to be better linked to knowledge in their specific space and, and allow that knowledge spiral to, to uh, move forward. So Tom, let me ask you to, to help us better understand what the hunger problem is. Um, you know, we all understand there is lots of poor people in the world, people living on a dollar or two dollars a day. It's they, they not only lack for food, but they lack for electricity. Many of them are not going to school, etc. Is the hunger problem a, a food problem per se, or is it m more simply an income problem that people don't, there's plenty of food, but it's a question of money. And I think it's an important answer because we might address it in different ways depending on how we understand it. Well, fundamentally, it is about access, having the capacity to access food. And that means if you don't have income, you don't, you, you don't have that capacity. And, and, I mean, that came into stark relief uh, in 2008 when the food price crisis happened. The price of food went up. Poor people spend a high proportion of their income on food. And their income didn't go up, so you had a you know within the space of a 18 months an additional 100 million people who were hungry. Uh, now it begins begins to 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 come down again with, as food prices dropped a bit. I mean, it, I think you do have to look at it in, in the longer term perspective. Say, it's the late 60s. The the world had about three and a half billion <coughs> three and a half billion people, and about 25 percent of that population were were hungry. Now you've seven billion people, and you're you're you've got about you know maybe twelve or thirteen percent, twelve to fifteen percent of the country of the population that are hungry. So, you know, in a way, the world food system has been a big success over the past fifty years. So we've doubled the number we've of doubled people the population, and the share and of hungry the percentage people percentage of people who are hungry. I think that's the simplest way to think about it. And where are most of those people, Tom? They're in, in Africa and they're in Asia. And, you know, it's very important to recognize that Asia is a big part of this problem as well in, in terms of the sheer numbers of people. Um, so, you know, if we are to, to, to tackle that, that last, if you like, 12 or 13 percent of hungry people, how do we go about it? Well, I think by anti-poverty programs, I think increasing food production in, in some of these countries in these countries is important because many of these 
poor people or hungry people are actually poor farmers. So getting increase in their productivity, investing in rural areas, rural societies, rural economies is also a critical part. And the other thing that I think is, is, is of really significant importance and it's something that has happened over the past few years and I think the US has had a really important role in this is the recognition that uh, you know, the, the early childhood nutrition, the first thousand days of, of a child's life, pregnancy and the first two years of a child's life, that is the critical moment because if you are to really attack hunger on a longer term basis, you have to go to that early call, the early causes of hunger which leads to stunting. And so, you know, the last few years, the world is recognising this is a more, much more significant figure or f issue and there is a much more targeted approach uh, at dealing with this and much more political uh, attention being given to it. And that is, is one of the, I would say, the hopeful signs at the moment, but it must be sustained. So tell us just a little more about that. I believe there's a program called Scaling Up Nutrition. Am I remembering that correctly? Sun? Yeah. Is that a matter of getting food that's grown elsewhere to these roughly one billion people whose children need it, or is it a matter of helping those subsistence farmers produce more on their own? Well, it's a matter of recognizing that there's a problem there. How you solve it, I think it, it, it has to be the predominantly the countries who have this problem have to recognize the problem and have <coughs> to deal with it themselves. And it'll be a variety of reasons. Some of it will be for increased farm productivity. More will be interventions directly focused on nutrition interventions directly focused. But it certainly is not, the, 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 the way to solve this is certainly not to think that this is going to be solved by, uh, by the US producing more food and sending it to those countries. That's not the, the answer. Um, Schengen, let me ask you about that because you grew up in China, you did your early education there, I know, and then you got your PhD in uh, economics from the University of Minnesota. That must have been a bit of a culture shock, but you've seen our system, you've seen their system, and I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that China is a success story in terms of the number of people who are hungry today versus, say, when you were a child there. Um, what's happened there, and is there any lesson we can take out of that experience that might apply to other places in Asia or even to Africa, which I know is one of your focuses. Yes, well, I grew up in a small village in China uh, about 50 years ago. Um, so I was poor, hungry, and uh, malnourished. So you can put all these uh, symptoms to me. Um, but the scale today, the problem of the scale, or scale of the problem today is still very big, huge. So 800, 870 million people are still undernourished and more than 2 billion people are actually um, so-called uh, experiencing hidden hunger. So you cannot see this person is hungry but because of lack of uh, minerals, micronutrients uh, in their diet, so their physical and uh, um, um, there's a physical and a mental health has been compromised because of that. Then in addition, from the previous section, I also heard that there's a huge, huge problem of overweight and obesity. So 1.4 billion people are suffering from overweight and uh, obese. So I can call it a triple burden of uh, uh, malnutrition, so undernourishment, uh, hidden hunger, as well as overweight or, over, or overnutrition. Yeah, the China has made a tremendous progress in the last uh, three decades in terms of its food production, um, improvement in nutrition status, well, as well as overall economic uh, transformation. So without China, uh, this so-called Millennium Development Goals, MDG1, uh, would have not met. So now by 2015, the world will be able to reduce the, num uh, the percentage of, of uh, poor people by half from 1990 to 2015. So China made a great contribution <coughs> in that reduction. I'm, I'm curious uh, if you've ever been back to the village where you grew up and, and, and maybe give us a little insight into how it's changed. Yeah. Well, um, 
some good news and some sad stories. The good news is, yes, uh, everything has been transformed. Forty years ago, we didn't have electricity. We didn't have good roads. I, have, I had to travel more than one hour to go to high school. Dark in the evening, you know, you know the Chinese students worked very hard, they stay very late. <laughs> so, but nowadays, when you go back, when I go back to my village, the roads have been improved. You know, from my village to Shanghai, probably three hours, used to be 10 hours, maybe even more. Electricity, the access to, um, to very clean, um, clean energy, like uh, gas. And more importantly, it's the people there. Now, many of them moved to the cities, by the way, moved to the cities, to Shanghai, Beijing, or even to U.S. like me. <laughs> um, the economic structure have also changed. So instead of smallholder one by one, like what is going on in Africa today, the farmers begin to pull the land together. So instead of one small plot here and there, so the farmers you know, put land together, an investor come to the village and invest uh, in that piece of land, consolidate, consolidate a big piece of land to produce vegetables, fruits, instead of rice and wheat, and ship them to Shanghai because of improved infrastructure. Mm. So the farmers receive two sources of income. One is obviously the rent from the land, because the farmers rent the land to the semester. Second, employment. The farmers also work for the semester, you know, 100 yuan per day, so two sorts of income. And the fascinating thing is, it's a mutual agreement. They need each other. The farmers need this investor with two sources of income, and the investor needs the land. So as you know, that in China, the farmers do not own the land. It's a connective. They jointly own the land. So it's a fascinating story. But the sad, the sad thing is, one is obviously depopulation in my village. We used to have 1,500 people in my village. Now, when I go back to my village, I feel very sad. Its population is only maybe 20%, 30%. And most of them are elderly, young, productive ones move to the cities. So the whole transformation has happened. I think U.S. probably experienced it in probably 200 years. China did it in 30 years. But the hunger and the malnutrition issue are still serious. Even the, the three dimension of the mal, malnourishment. So undernourishment, China still has millions and millions of people who do not have access to adequate food. And malnourishment, lack of vitamins, lack of minerals in their diet, you know, just eating rice and wheat. And thirdly, overweight obesity have increased much faster than economic growth rate. In China, <laughs> In even. China, that's right. So you see many children in Shanghai, Beijing, have become very heavy over overweight, obese, and probably the first time in China you will see the decline of life expectancy in the next 20 or 30 years if China does not act quickly. So, Schengen, I'm going to come back to you and Tom in a couple of minutes to talk about the role of both U.S. policymakers and U.S. business in dealing with this hunger problem as you've described it. But before I do that, I want to go to Jason. Um, so, Jason is a Ph.D. psychologist, so he understands the psychology of food, which is very important. He spent some time researching anti-obesity drugs, but he's now um, working on a project, and I'm not going to pronounce this totally right. It's called SATIN, which stands for Satiety Innovation, meaning you're satiated, you, you've had enough. So Satiety Innovation... And uh, I'm going to ask you just to talk about what satiety innovation is and the kind of counterintuitive notion that perhaps if we change the kinds of food we eat, that eat, it sounds wonderful actually, eating could help solve the obesity problem. Okay. Uh, satiety, you got it completely right. I worked at it. Is kind of the flip side to hunger. It's the processes which feed back during a meal and after the meal, which makes you feel satisfied, the derivation of the word, and prevents you consuming more afterwards. 
Now, the problem with the diet that we've developed is it's very energy dense. It has a lot of sugar and lots of refined fats. And there are good reasons for that. Evolutionary, those are the sorts of nutrients that we needed, wanted and desired because they were scarce. And it's obviously been driven by improvements in production. It's been driven by consumer preference. But that results in foods which are very immediately gratifying, but in the long term have a weak impact on our appetite regulatory systems. And so we end up very easily over-consuming foods. And if you look at the rates of obesity, excuse me, in North America or Europe, you see they've trebled over the past 20 or 30 years. We've always had a biological disposition to become obese, but it's the radical change in the environment which has allowed that phenotype to be displayed in populations, particularly urban populations, across the globe. And we see this even in sub-Saharan Africa, where some of the acute crises in hunger are seen. Now, we know we have to reformulate the foods that we are choosing, the foods that we are eating for health. So we know we need to reduce amounts of rapidly digestible carbohydrate. We know we have to reduce levels of fats and sugars. But blaming specific nutrients is kind of missing the point. We don't eat macronutrients, we eat a diet. And we've got to change the diet. Whether that's increasing the amounts of fresh fruits and vegetables we consume, or whether we're changing the processed foods which we can consume, it's the same thing. Processed foods are not going to disappear. So we need to reformulate them to be more healthy and less energy dense. And where we can, we should use the attributes of foods, specific macronutrients, fibres, proteins, so on and so forth, to provide added functionality, added health benefit. And we can do that by isolating the dimensions, the proponents or components of food which have particularly potent effects on appetite. We've been trying to do this with pharmacology for a while and we had some successes. But drugs are expensive, they're correcting a problem in the diet which we can address through the diet and they also tend to come with side effects, which is why drugs have come and they have gone. You can do the same sorts of things with foods. They don't have pharmacological effects, but it's a more practicable solution. The only other solution is obesity surgery, which obviously the bariatric surgeons will tell you is a runaway success. We don't know the long-term consequences of obesity surgery. Certainly they seem very impressive, but there are individual differences there. And really, is the proposition of replumbing the gastrointestinal tracts of a quarter of the, say, US population the solution to the problem that we are facing? <laughs> And so, you know, not all the solutions are in biotechnology, not all the solutions are in projects like the Satin Project, which you refer to. There is a bigger picture here. But innovation can help as part of a broad portfolio of solutions. So, I mean, I've not heard any about anything about this, so I'm quite interested. Can you be a little more specific? What would one do to a particular food to, in a sense trigger, I think, if I'm understanding this right, trigger a message to the brain that says, I've had enough. Well, you can do all sorts of things. You can interfere with the sensory properties, make it feel creamy, more satisfying in the mouth without putting the fat in there to produce that feeling. Uh, you can do a little bit around its f action in the stomach. There are gelling agents which produce bulking in the stomach. That slows gastric emptying. It literally keeps you fuller for longer. Uh, and you what... Can, what so what food, give me an example of a food you might alter to do some of these things. It's obviously not going to work. You, you're You'd not have to alter all foods. You'd have to, you, you, you can't, you know, everybody's obesity is different and everybody has particular problems with, di with differing foods, whether it's snacking or overconsumption in the evening or, or a, a variety of other psychological problems in controlling appetite. These foods will work for some people in some food matrices. Uh, you could be looking at snack bars, you could be looking at dairy, you could be looking at whole meal replacements, you could be looking at beverages. The sorts of ingredients we tend to look at are fibres, the sorts of ingredients we tend to look at are proteins, although you can do a little bit with functional oils. The problem we've had so far is 
40 years of, of knowledge in the lab doesn't translate to good food products because as soon as you give people high fibre or as soon as you give people protein, they won't eat it because they produce dreadful food products which don't sell, are expensive to produce and don't actually last all that long on the shelf. So the trick now in the innovation is to make smaller manipulations which are acceptable to consumers and are cheap uh, to put into the marketplace. We'll come back to this, but just the last question before I c- turn to Steve again. Who is part of this satin project? Is it academics, or do you have food companies, um, biotech companies involved? All. 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 So, so we, have seven, we have seven SMEs, four multinationals, and seven universities. Hmm. And Which multinationals? The multinationals are Coca-Cola, Cargill, uh, a Spanish drinks company called Juvier, and also we have in there Natrex, who are an ingredient producer which are based <coughs> across the world but also have a, a US present, presence as well. The SMEs tend to be lots of small biotechs or ingredients companies or food formulation companies, uh, generally in the Benelux area or, or Spain or Italy, and the academic universities are Spain, UK, Scandinavia. So it's a European initiative yes, at the moment. across Europe. Great. All right, well, maybe we'll have a chance to hear more about that, and certainly we welcome any questions on it. I'm going to probably whip through the panel one more time, and then I'm going to ask for your help with questions. So, Steve, um, (coughs) prevention of post-harvest loss is one of the issues you're looking at. It's gotten a lot of attention in the last few years. I think I've, you know, seen numbers that strike me as, uh, hard to believe, but perhaps they're true, that you know, 33% of all food grown is wasted somewhere between the field and the garbage can because it does include post-consumer waste in that calculation. Can you help us by giving us a kind of realistic, pragmatic sense of what the food waste opportunity is? Because obviously... If we waste less food, environmental impacts would be less, energy impacts would be less, supply would be more. It's something we want to think about and do, but how realistic is it? So we're dealing with numbers that are uh, imprecise. May be true, but imprecise uh, in, in how they were generated. We, are, we have many more estimates than we have what my ag engineering colleagues would like to have as measurement. Because measurement of the system in the system is expensive. And so there are good reasons we don't have good measures. Another thing is our terminology. Uh, And I think you used the phrase that a third of the food is wasted. Now, it may be true, and and so that goes into what does wasted mean? Does that mean that people were just throwing it away along the way uh, just because they felt like it? Or does it mean that a third of the food that's in the field doesn't get to its eventual end use? Uh, and those are kind of different things. Um, there, there's, there's that, and, and I'm going to assert that zero is not the relevant benchmark. Right. When, we, when we hear those numbers of a third or a half is wasted in, in media and other places, there's, there's kind of an implicit message that, well, zero would be what we would want. Well, it would be. But it would be really, really, really costly. And it, it, it may be impossible, but it would really be costly. So the data and, and of course, grains are more like 15 or 20 percent. Uh, fruits and vegetables, we'll see numbers that are in the 60 or 70 percent, uh, particularly in developing countries. I think reduction of food law, and there's a, there's a reason I'm hesitating, there's conventional Discussion right now is saying food loss refers to the food chain from the farm field to, say, grocery. Uh, food waste is us. Uh, it's the lunch we're going to have. Uh, you know, it's what we do as consumers. And so th- there's kind of this uh, convention that's developing in both those. So reducing those. Um, Focus on post-harvest loss, which is what okay. you're focused on right, for right. now, because we're we're never going to get every child in America to eat 100 percent of their broccoli, right? Um, no, we're we're not. Um, <laughs> I have four daughters and six grandkids, so I can, I can definitely say that. And their their dad is and granddad is just as big a problem, frankly. Um, 
you know, I think in a, in, a, in a sustainable manner, economically, environmentally sustainable, we, we maybe should be searching for a goal of reducing post-harvest loss by 20%. Of, of what it is. I think that, and I'm really just speaking uh, without a lot of uh, science behind it, um, you know, if we can move that third down to 25%, that's a huge amount of product, and, and that would be very, very useful. And I think it's realistic, but it's not zero. So how? Where are the opportunities? Um, well, my, my brother, the farmer, would say raise crop prices. <laughs> you know, if the price if the price of the wheat is higher, I'll pay more attention to it. Um, and that's from the farmers. They, that's what they would like me to uh, assert, which is some truth to it. Um, application, understanding why, and this goes back to what I was saying about the role of the cell phone. Why aren't people using the technologies that are available today? They're good reasons. They're behavioral, economic, social we need to be working, in my opinion, on understanding those whys. We know how to store grain. We know how to store fruits and vegetables. Why aren't we doing it? And so focusing on the whys may be as simple as providing good educational materials through a cell phone that's a, 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 car, a cartoon rather than uh, an extension brochure handed out to a village of people where the literacy is low. Uh, show them cartoons of exactly what they should be doing. That's something we're working on. Um, so it's a complex, it's a suite of things. It's not, it's not one thing. It's, um, it's small machines that reduce the amount of time and effort and loss in shelling something called pearl millet in Africa. Uh, and that's a solution, that's a contribution for pearl millet, but go down the road and they have maize, and it's a difference. So that's part of the problem with post-harvest loss is it's very complex and it's very location-specific. So you're working on it outside the U.S. as well as in the U.S. then? Uh, we, we are funded, and I should say this, the title of the institute is the ADM Institute for Prevention of Post-Harvest Loss at the University of Illinois, and you can say it very rapidly. Um, it, we are funded by a gift from ADM, and our, our mandate, our gift agreement, and this is a gift, it's not a grant, it's not a contract, it's a gift, is that we work in developing countries. So almost all of our work... Um, <coughs> Well, all of our work to this point has been in developing countries. We focus a lot in India and Brazil, uh, but, but also Africa and, and other countries. So our, no, our focus is totally in developing countries. So it's not the finicky U.S. consumer. It really is flaws within the supply chain and distribution system, refrigeration issues, the, the 12-hour road trip that Schengen was talking about that or, or, becomes or a three-hour trip. Yeah, or the no road. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Those, those issues are all, all part of it. Um, uh, although I was on a panel a few months ago where uh, one of the panelists was from India and was talking about Indian weddings uh, as, as a source of food waste. So it's not, the food waste is not, is not just a, a U.S.-Europe problem. Okay, and last question. Um, what's, the, uh, what's the openness to embracing this issue in the countries where you're working on it? Well, at one level, who's against waste? At another level, uh, doing, doing the hard work which goes beyond technologies to understanding behavior, understanding the, the, the why things are... It's, it's not so much an openness. It's hard. That's, it, it's, it's hard work. It's detailed work. So it's not... And the openness is, is very open. But then we get down to... And I was in a meeting yesterday where I understand that President Obama has a, some, a thing on his desk that says hard work is hard. Um, and and post-harvest law is, is hard work because it involves people. And why do people do what they do? And then how can technology supplement that? But fundamentally, it's about people. So openness is not a problem. So, Tom, what's the role of folks in this room who come from Capitol Hill and from the food industry Maybe not only is what the role, but is there an opportunity for people in this room to to deal with the hunger crisis? Is there a sort of bottom billion business opportunity maybe? I think so. Um, and again, I think you need to look at it in the somewhat longer term perspective. I mean, the reason why real food prices fell over a four-decade period was because really of the contribution of the Green Revolution. That was a U.S. contribution. Uh, but that 
induced over a, a period of decades uh, perhaps a complacency about food security and governments in developing countries and donor aid programs began reduce their investment in agriculture and sometime in the last decade the penny dropped that this needed to change and it dropped even faster and harder when the food price crisis of 2008 came along. So now there are, in many developing countries, an acknowledgement that they have to invest more in agriculture. And this then coincided as well, I think, with the Obama administration coming in and having as one of its keynote programs the Feed the Future program. And I think that's been a very progressive program. Um, I heard uh, Tom Tom Vilsack yesterday speak, we were at the same meeting, uh, speak about in a sense, the opportunity that that program is helping countries develop their own economies. And ultimately, that's in the long-term interest of the US to create markets. Uh, So where then the other elements of this contribution are engagement with the private sector, uh, engagement with the land-grant universities, the whole knowledge inheritance that the US has, and engaging probably in in a different way than in the past, uh, you know, in, in, in supporting agriculture. Because where Food the Future is, is focusing its efforts, now it's in 19 countries, but it's in the countries that have demonstrated their own willingness mm-hmm. to change policy. So I think that's pretty smart use of resources. Um, the other area where, you know, it's, it's, I know it's a, an issue of current controversy, the proposal to have some changes in the food aid policy, uh, you know, as part of the Farm Bill discussion. And essentially what Raj Shah was saying yesterday was that for the same amount of money, you can, you can uh, you know, feed f- uh, you know, a lot more children um, by shifting from exclusively uh, sourcing your food aid here in the US to having a mixture of cash and, uh, you know, and per- local purchase. And, you know, that for me makes a great deal of sense. And, and I think it's a, it's a progressive thing. And the final area where I think the US has made a real contribution is in this focus on early childhood nutrition. Mm-hmm. And Hillary Clinton was a very instrumental in that, in providing real international leadership here. And that has now translated into 35 countries signing up to this scaling up nutrition movement. And that's a commitment at political level in these countries to address uh, early childhood nutrition with all the long-term beneficial consequences that that has. So the US has an absolutely crucial political and I would say almost moral responsibility role and I think it's playing it well at the moment. Hmm. That's good to hear. Um, I have to ask you because you, besides your work with Concern, you also did um, service with the Ireland government Ag department, so you're familiar with EU, US policy. Do you think the um, resistance of the EU to transgenic crops in any way is contributing to the hunger issues, say, in Africa because of either difficulty importing the technology or importing the food itself? What's your perspective on that? I don't really think that's a major factor. I mean, I think the real problems of of, um, hunger in Africa are, you know, they they can be resolved by doing a lot of other things. I don't think transgenic crops at this stage of their, of their development is, is going to be the crucial difference. Uh, Paul said it in the earlier comment that if many of these countries and their farmers had the most simple existing technology and access to f- inputs and access to markets, that would be, for the moment, a huge advance. And I, I think the transgenic issue is actually a red herring in this discussion. Okay. Schengen, what about your perspective on the role of both U.S. policymakers, the people in the room here, and U.S. business? Yeah, one of the important aspects is the capacity of the countries in designing their own strategies, programs, and investment priorities. So the U.S. universities, Nanguan universities, research institutions, can work with Africans, Asians, to build their capacities in the 60s and the 70s, why Asian had a green revolution? That's because of the close collaboration between the U.S. and India and Pakistan. Uh, then in the 80s, 90s, maybe even to, uh, to the, new, the beginning of the new millennium, 
that effort has come down dramatically. So I really hope that the U.S. will re resume its effort to work with international organizations like ours to build the capacity in Africa, in Asia, so they can on drive and lead their own development programs. So this is so critical. If you look at the successful transformations across the countries, <coughs> you will see these successes usually are not aren't driven by their own people. They are, they are driven internally more than externally, That's right, you're but saying. But external capacity building will be so critical. So those, those large numbers of people who were on the undernourished category of, I don't remember how long ago it was, Tom, the three well, million. In 60, well, the Green Revolution, the end of the 60s, and, and yeah. But then 25% of the world's population was hungry at this, at this stage. Half of that percentage of a larger population is, so, is now hungry. So my question, Schengen, so those folks are basically eating local food for the most part. In other words, it's not movement of food from the U.S. to those countries that has helped dealt with the problem. You, at least in China, you said they're growing their own food, fundamentally. Well, yeah, mostly you're right, but uh, in some cases, the food aid, food aid also helped, particularly in the 60s, maybe 70s, um, and in Africa. But today, I think we have to move away from that uh, to make sure that the local producers, the new local farmers can produce their own food. And you, so, by local, you don't mean within 50 miles of the town, you mean essentially in the country, in the region, correct? Sure. So we, well, we are not against the, uh, the market or trade, right? So we wanted to use market and the trade to make sure that the people can share different products, different foods, so they can diversify their, their, their consumption. The so diversity contributes to better nutrition and higher quality. But today the problem in Africa is because of lack of production, lack of income uh, opportunities. So they, they suffer from hunger and, and malnutrition. Um, I'm going to chat for a moment with Jason, but then anyone who has a question on hunger, food waste, or obesity, please gather at the microphone while we do that. So, Jason, I want to ask you a, a sort of simplistic question question by design and tell me why this isn't a useful way to think about the obesity problem. But I, I hear from some people in the business world, they often don't want to necessarily have their name attached to this, but they will say to me, it's a pretty simple problem. It's individual choices of calories in and calories out. And we're socializing the problem. We're turning it into a corporate responsibility issue. We're turning it into an environmental problem. And we're taking people off the hook, and that's not the right approach. What would your counter-argument be to the person who says that to you? Right. Fundamentally, I would agree in one sense that we know the energy balance equation is important. So energy in versus energy out. And if we have too much energy mm -hmm. coming in the system and not enough energy going out, there is weight gain. Uh, you know, th that's evidence, and the ancient Greeks knew that, so that's nothing new. That information hasn't stopped uh, rates of obesity and overweight tripling in the West, and now we're seeing a much more rapid rise across the globe. And in and of itself, there is a, a, naive, a naivety about that. A, there's a sort of deceptive simplicity, and it comes down to behaviour. Behaviour is lifelong learnt. And it is formed in an environment. If it's formed in an obesity-promoting environment, it is very difficult to change. So behaviour, as any psychologist, attitudes are difficult to shift. It's hard enough to get people to change attitudes. But even if you get that attitudinal change, there is no guarantee that their behaviour goes on to alter. <laughs> so this is why often public health campaigns tend to flounder. As you know, we, we all know, we know, we knew smoking was bad, but obviously tobacco is addictive. Uh, I'm not saying foods are addictive in the same way. That's not where I'm taking that argument. I'm not going down the Robert Lustig route here. But it is still difficult to alter these things. And if you put it in a system which is constantly promoting high fat, high salt and high sugar and is not sufficiently promoting the alternatives, you can see why that behaviour isn't changing because all the drivers are pushing people the other way. And the other thing 
to understand is it is fairly easy to put weight on. But dieting is fundamentally difficult. And I suppose many of you on this, in this room have been on a diet. And in the short term, you may have done well, but you will have put the weight back on. <laughs> dieting is difficult. Keeping the weight off seems almost impossible. And there are good reasons for that. Your body physiologically will defend your current weight status, no matter what your weight status is. And also, when you are dieting, you go into psychological deprivation. It, causes, it interferes with cognitive processes. It, it causes a, re, a, a reduction in mood. These are precisely the things that you don't want to happen because they make the dieting process difficult. Somebody was talking to me about stress-induced eating and, and why do I respond to stress by over-consuming? Because you're cognitively overloaded. Because dietary restriction uses psychological resources up. So that's why it's difficult. Mm. But yes, the energy balance equation is important, but we can alter lots of those parameters to help people make the right choices, and that would be my argument. So, and that's why you're focusing on food. You're, you're changing the stimuli. You're changing the... It's only uh, a small part of the picture. We, we need to look at what we're producing. We need to look at what we're promoting. What and, we're subsidising. And, and, what, and what, we're so, what we choose to subsidise and what we don't. And we still predominantly produce, uh, promote high fat, salt and sugar. I work in the regulation of, of advertising to children. And quite frankly, the nutritional profile of the foods which are advertised to, uh, to American and European children in their peak viewing times, are absolutely atrocious. There is a major misbalance there. You know, altering foods and making them healthier is, is with one component, but there is what we choose to promote as well. And it's a matter of the balance is wrong. We've got to shift the balance. But the people who are going to do that are people sat in this room and people in the food industry. So I, as an academic or somebody interested in policy, has to engage with that because you are the people who are going to deliver that. It's not going to be delivered out of a white tower from a university. Schengen, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, to what uh, Jason said. In addition to behavior change, the public policy is also needed. We know that uh, the overweight and obesity were not only contributed to that individual's health problem, but also the whole society's problem. This whole society has to pay health, but also environmental issues. You know, by eating more, you actually need more water, more land, more energy to produce. But um, the market failed to take that into consideration. So the, the pricing right now does not reflect the health and the environmental cost. Mm. You know, as economists, when the market does not work, does not deliver social uh, benefit, then the public policy is needed. So public policy in developing countries, like India, China, where well, they should have removed some of the subsidies for bad foods. Rice, wheat, you know, a certain amount is okay, but overeating definitely is a problem. Diabetes. And so can we reduce the rice, wheat subsidies in mm -hmm. India and invest more in research on vegetables, fruits, improving the whole value chains of vegetables and fruits. Um, so you corrected that market failure. Now, in rich countries like here in the U.S., well, you know, I, I know that in this time it's very difficult to talk about taxing. Why don't we tax unhealthy food, subsidize or invest in more healthy food, fruits and vegetables? Because the market will not do that. Public policy is needed. You're saying the full cost of food isn't reflected yeah, in its that's price, right. Correct. basically. I think that's very good. Please. Well, in the previous session, there was a lot of emphasis on, at the beginning, on uh, price instability, and especially the price spikes as being the big hunger issue, and biofuels and certain other things that have been happening were identified as uh, uh, a big cause of that, uh, of that problem. But it, it seemed like this session sort of started out with, you know, don't worry, you know, it's, it's took sort of the poor farmer perspective and said, you know, for development, you know, it's, it's really these guys that are, that are going to be the, the ones that have to solve this, you know, which it seems to me is, you know, I mean, the earlier argument seems to me is once you've got the urban poor and, the, and, and most of the rural poor, poor uh, being net food importers, that seems to me the prices are extremely important. Price volatility and especially the, you know, the high prices 
So you want to have prices. You don't want to go back to where we were 12 years ago, where producers in poor countries didn't have enough incentive to produce. But on the other hand, I think the points that were made earlier this morning are very valid. And I'm, I'm a little confused by the, you know, we just look at the long term here, and as long as we're, we're headed, you know, toward some kind of balance in the future, I mean, it seems to me like people could starve pretty quickly. And, you know, a price volatility seems to me like a huge problem. And mm. um, as it is, then we need to focus on the policy issues, because right now, this country's policy is to try to increase biofuel production any way we can. To increase? Biofuel production any way we can. Mm. And there's a lot of effort to do that going on right now. So, it, respond. I mean, I can Both try to address this issue. There's a, my institution, the International Food Policy Research Institute, has looked at that issue very, very carefully, very intensively for the last five or six years. Uh, yes, when the food prices uh, began to move higher, uh, many poor suffered. The poor urban consumers suffered because of higher prices. Even rural, rural poor suffered because many, more than half of the uh, producers or farmers in developing countries actually are not buyers of food, or either through food aid or through the purchase from the market. So definitely, the higher food prices hurt poor. However, to look into the future, we are not afraid of higher food prices. What we don't like is volatility. Volatility, volatility hurts consumers as well as producers. The producers cannot predict the prices. They underinvest. Um, they are risk averse. So now the smallholders suffered because they do not have access to seeds, to technologies, to markets. So their production cannot, cannot increase and they cannot link their production to markets. So that's the key issue we need to work on to make sure that smallholders have access to markets, have access to technology so they can uh, increase their, produce, their, their surplus so they can enjoy higher food prices when food prices do move higher. Hmm. Steve, do you want to comment on that? Uh, just real quickly, um, certainly price volatility is, is harmful for, for the poor. Unfortunately, and over the, maybe the last 50 years, there's been a tendency in many countries to solve that problem by lowering the price of food and then being surprised when farmers don't grow more food the next year. So if there's a food price spike, that's, a, that's an income problem. That, that, that's the income of the poor problem in, in my mind. If we treat it as an agricultural problem, which is lower the price, we're not going to get more produced. And so we've got to unravel these things, even though it says food price, that doesn't necessarily mean that's an agricultural problem. If we treat it as an agricultural problem, and we, we've done this around the world in the last 40 or 50 years, uh, we find out we go the wrong way in terms of being able to provide food at low cost even if profitably produced. So I, I think we, we, it's really hard that we need to disentangle these things, and it's not all, everything around food isn't an agricultural problem. I think I'm getting a signal that we're out of time, am I right? So despite, we're, it's the, we're out of time. The good news is the end of food has not yet arrived. We're gonna have lunch. <laughs> so we will adjourn. Um, before we do so, please join me in thanking Tom and Steve and Jason and Schengen.